Red Rocks Church. How we doing, guys? In your living rooms? I'm in a big room right now, preaching to about eight people. Eight plus one, that's nine, that's less than 10. You could even check my math on that if you want. But I know these eight people in this room are gonna get rowdy. They're gonna get loud. They're gonna shout me down. They're gonna say amen when it's appropriate to say amen. And how many know it's always appropriate to say amen. And you might be in your living room with a few people, some roommates, your family, or by yourself right now, but I want you to know that you have the ability to shift the atmosphere of your home by your faith, by your expectancy, by your passion, and by your praise. And so I hope you know that you are in the right place at the right time. Wherever you find yourself listening to this, watching this right now, you are in the right place at the right time. I'm praying that you're in sweatpants or your PJs. I pray that you just had blueberry pancakes or French toast. I pray that you have toilet paper. If you don't, just DM our Red Rocks Austin account. We'll try to figure that out for you. But you are in the right place at the right time. I feel like God wants me to say that to you, that you're in the right place at the right time to experience what he thinks about you. So with that said, turn to somebody right now and say, this sermon's for me. Now say it like this, I know this is for me. You better be saying that at home too. If, you're, if it's just you and your roommates, if it's just you and your dog, you tell your dog, dog, I know this is for me. If you're home by yourself right now, you get out your phone and you text the link for this message to your friend and say, friend, you, you, don't have, you can you know, personalize it. This is for me. And you tell them, I know that this is for you too. Because these are, these are crazy times that we're walking through right now. This is... It's a, a horrible season and historical. The, the, this is a season our kids are going to be reading about in history books one day. And uh, we've been saying a lot around here that we're trying as best as we can to see every obstacle as an opportunity. And I know that we're social distancing right now. Even the eight people in this room are sitting rows apart from each other. My wife and I, when we were dating, we did long distance for about a year. We did super duper long distance. In other words, I was on the other side of the world and we didn't get to meet with each other or see each other or even be in the same country as each other for an entire year. That's some extreme social distancing. And so we had to get creative on how to communicate, right? We wrote, we wrote letters to each other, 365. I wrote her every day for a year, church. We, we, we emailed every single day. We Skyped twice. That's all we could because I had the world's worst Wi-Fi. But somebody told me about the triangle theory. The triangle theory, imagine, imagine an equilateral triangle, 60 degree angles, structurally the strongest shape. Engineers, I think I got that right. This is God at the top. Let's say this was me and this was my wife. And we couldn't, because of social distancing, we couldn't pursue each other this way. Geographically, we were separated, but the more we pursued God, you like that? How romantic is this? The closer and closer we got. So even though we were far away, we could still get closer to each other through God. And how many know times like this turn two-dimensional metaphors into three-dimensional metaphors? What is a three-dimensional triangle? You might say pyramid. It's not a pyramid. It's actually a cone. Oh, I have one right here. It's a cone. A cone is a triangle with an infinite amount of like if this is the triangle theory changed into the cone theory, an infant, like this is a community that has room. This is a table that has room for a million people. And we might not be able to be with each other physically if this is God up here and this is everybody down here. We are social distancing, but the more we get creative in our community, in our communication, the more we, we have Zoom groups and Netflix hangouts and the more we pursue God and pray for each other, the closer and closer we get. And this will make us stronger. Make no mistake about it. The year that I spent apart from my wife when we were dating was brutal in so many ways, but I wouldn't trade that for anything now because because of what it taught us. We got creative in our communication and in our communion with each other. And now because of that, we are stronger than ever. And when this season comes to an end, and it will come to an end, every valley has one thing in common, they all end. And when it does, church, we will be better for it. I promise you, 
It's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough. But Jesus walks with you the entire way through the valley. There is pressure on us, and pressure can cause panic. Pressure can cause paralysis. But pressure, if you use it correctly, also makes diamonds. It's seasons like this that the church comes alive. It's seasons like this that Christians are at their best. And if you're watching this, which you are, you've been prayed for. And we're believing that to be true for you. So welcome to Red Rocks Church. We're in week one of a three-week sermon series called In the Shadow of a Pandemic. It's a crazy season we're living in right now. It's a storm we're walking through. It's a, it's a shadow. But let me quote John Foreman, lead singer of Switchfoot to you. The shadow proves the sunshine. In other words, if you're sitting in the shadow of a tree, that shadow is only there because there's a sun on the other side of that tree shining to create that dark spot. If the coronavirus pandemic is, a, is casting a shadow, and it is, make no mistake, that shadow is only there because there's something bigger and brighter and better on the other side of it. And that's what we're called to put our hope in as Christians. Our hope is not in what's happening right here and right now. We might be here, but our hope is in the sun shining on the other side of the tree. That sun that proves the goodness of our God. The shadow that proves the sunshine to make that dark spot. Thank you, John Foreman. But now let me quote a different John. Not lead singer of Switchfoot, John, but... Jesus Christ's best friend, John, the self-proclaimed most beloved apostle, John, from John chapter 1, verse 5. Here it is. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Can I get an amen? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so we're going to call this message, even at home if you're taking notes, and you get triple points, eternal points, if you take notes at home. We're gonna call this, in the shadow of a pandemic, we sober up to eternity. We sober up to eternity. And so Jesus, we love you. It's seasons like this that your peace and your joy that go beyond our understanding do their best work. And sometimes all we gotta do is ask for it. And so boldly right here and right now, I ask in the name of Jesus for an overwhelming amount of joy and peace, like a blanket to fall on our world and invade the homes and hearts of anybody right now who needs it. And I pray something interesting right now, God. I pray that we would use this opportunity to come face to face with our own mortality because I believe you wanna teach us something in that space. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You might be thinking, Doug, that end of that prayer got heavy. Tell us a joke, we need a joke, tell us a good story. Okay, here's one. Have you ever been in the wrong place at the wrong time? The wrong place in the wrong time, maybe like Ben Stiller in every movie he's ever been in, where he's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Meet the Parents is just two hours of Ben Stiller being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it's so predictable. You're like, oh, he's on the roof. I wonder if he's going to accidentally slip at the wrong moment and hit a gutter, causing a chain reaction that sets the house on fire, right? Oh, I hope he doesn't accidentally at the wrong moment flush the wrong toilet in the den, causing, causing the septic tank to overflow all over the yard two hours before the wedding. Oh, he does. Of course he does because he's always in the right place, in the wrong place, excuse me, at the wrong time. This brings me to fifth grade. Fifth grade, I had a teacher, and we'll just call her Miss Peppercorn. If you know, you know, Sandlot reference. Why? Because Miss Peppercorn, my teacher, she was a babe. She just was. And, and that made school my new favorite thing. And paying attention for me was super easy. All of a sudden, my grades skyrocketed, right? My attention span was, like, amazing. I'm getting check pluses in all of my subjects or star pluses, whatever it was. My parents are like, like what, where did this come from? All of a sudden, we have a genius in the house until, like, the first parent-teacher conference. And they're like, oh. Okay, they meet Miss Peppercorn. Okay, needless to say, I was, I was crushing hard. 
Well, on the final day of fifth grade, we had a big kickball game in the field behind our classroom. And I don't want to brag. This is not about me. This is about God. But I'm really good at kickball. Like really good, especially in fifth grade. Now, is this, a, is this a, a plug for our Red Rock Sports Kickball League? Absolutely it is. But guys, this is, this is about God. So focus, okay? I'm really good at kickball. And this is my chance because it's the final day of fifth grade. Miss Peppercorn's there. I'm up to bat, and I'm like, this is where I can impress her. Like, this is where I shine. And I made, like, I'm up to bat, and I make a deal with God. The first bargain I ever struck up with God. And I said, God, if I kick a home run, if I kick this thing into orbit right now, then here's the deal. Me and Miss Peppercorn will get married and live happily ever after. Yeah. And I'm seeing that now from God's perspective. He's got to be like, well, I get nothing from this bargain, first of all, so it's not really a bargain. Um, Also, you're 10 and she's 29, so this is creepy and illegal. (laughs) But you entertain me, buddy. What can I say? I love you. You entertain me. Also, I know what's about to happen because I'm God. So sure, yeah, if you kick a home run, you and Miss Peppercorn will get married. And so the pitch comes in. The ball gets rolled. It's a little bouncy, which, which if you, like, you can capitalize if you time the bounce right, if you time it right, okay? And so I'm running up just so, like, my confidence is through the roof. Miss Peppercorn is right over there. And right before, like, it takes its final hop, the final bounce, and hits a rock that is in the wrong place at the wrong time, causing a bad hop, causing the ball to move and bounce about six feet to my right. And I'm kicking so hard. And like Charlie Brown kicking a football when Lucy pulls it out of the way, like, my foot comes through at 1,000 miles an hour. My body follows it. I'm doing, like, half a backflip and in midair I kid you not I see Miss Peppercorn out of the corner of my eye and I'm thinking I just blew like everything like this was my moment all I had to offer her was my kickball skills literally that's it and now like she sees me as a fraud I'm thinking all of this as I'm also thinking this is gonna hurt so bad and then I slam my back and my head into the earth blackout for a split second knocks the wind out of me but the physical pain was nothing and I mean nothing compared to the emotional agony of knowing I ruined whatever shot I thought I had with my 29 year old fifth grade teacher Miss Peppercorn she saw the whole thing she was in the wrong place at the wrong time the rock was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. My life, I thought, at the moment was ruined and over. But don't worry. We ended up even moving about a year after that to Colorado, then Austin. I met my own Miss Peppercorn, who was closer to my age. And I married her. And we're like right now, we are sitting on the couch watching this service right now because we actually filmed this about five days before. You're watching it right now. And so I'm doing just fine. I got my own Miss Peppercorn. I'm probably eating, if I can just be prophetic, uh, French toast. Okay, so don't worry about me. There's French toast in my future or present. (laughs) What is going on right now? You're like, when does this guy read the Bible? In just a second. We've been in quarantine. I've got a lot of stuff. I've got a lot of stuff to say. Hey, listen to me. Today, you're not me on the kickball field in fifth grade. You're certainly not Ben Stiller in every movie he's ever been in. Today, you are in the right place at the right time. In your living room, in your car, in bed still, wherever you are, you are in the right place at the right time to experience and hear what the God of the universe thinks about you. He does not do coincidence. It is no mistake you're listening to this message right now. And so I pray that you would lean in and hear these words like it's on purpose because it certainly is on God's end. John chapter 4 is a story about somebody else being in the right place at the right time. So Jesus is with his disciples. His, he's with his boys and they're on a, on a little journey from Galilee to Judea. All right, And in between Galilee and Judea is Samaria. So there's two routes. You can either go through Samaria, but then you have to see Samaritans, 
Or you can do what every Jew does and go around Samaria, even though it takes a lot longer because they believe that like the fever, like the prejudice against Samaritans was at, was at a fever pitch in Jesus's day, right? They believed the Samaritans were half breed, half Jews, not to even be like talk to so uh, like no you don't go through Samaria but Jesus once again does not do coincidence and Jesus makes an interesting decision to go through Samaria so here we go so he came to a sound a town in Samaria called Sychar did I read that right Sychar 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 see nobody knows if I just say it confidently Sychar turn to your neighbor and say Sychar turn to your dog and say dog it's pronounced Sychar there you go Nobody check me on that. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. That's important. The heat of the day. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to get Chipotle. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, oh, if you knew the gift of God and who it is right now that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So just to recap, halfway through Samaria, Jesus gets tired, which you do. You're walking through the desert. You've got sandals on. You're going to get tired. And he sits down next to a well and sends his boys into town to get some Chick-fil-A. So now notice, Jesus sits down next to a well, which represents water, the basic necessity of life, right? Eventually, you, you got to drink water. Eventually, you need to come back to the well. And while he's there, a woman shows up in the middle of the day. So why does she come to the well at noon in the middle of the day? It's because she doesn't want to be seen. She, like, she doesn't want to interact with anybody because she, she's the outcast of her town. As far as she's concerned, religiously, she's messed up more than anybody that she knows. And the people who see her certainly let her know about it. And back in that day, you'd go to the well to get water early in the morning at dawn or at dusk in the cool of the day, not in the 110 degree desert heat. She's crazy for going to the well at noon, but she's that desperate just to not talk to, to anybody and hear all about how she's, she's messed up. And wouldn't you know, as she's there, a Jewish rabbi shows up and she's probably thinking, oh, awesome another person to hate me, just what I need right now. And Jesus, of course, he, he strikes up a conversation with her in her lonely place and says, can you give me a drink of, of water? And she goes, you're, you're a, a male Jewish rabbi. I'm a female Samaritan screw up. Why are you talking to me right now? We don't, we don't associate with each other, and Jesus said, oh, woman, if you knew the gift, I love this. This will sound beautiful to us, but picture how confused she has to be. If you knew the gift God wanted to give you, you would have asked him for living water, and I would give it to you. Oh, if you knew the gift God wanted to give you, you would ask him for living water, and I would give it to you. So like, don't think, oh, that's so, that's so beautiful. Because from her perspective, she's got to be thinking, that's not like lovely poetry, living water. Like, what language are you speaking? What the heck are you talking about? What, what like this living water, is that like sparkling water? Like carbonated? Like, is that LaCroix? Is this, is this Mike's secret stuff from Space Jam that Bugs Bunny drank and then was jacked out of his mind just like a few seconds after that? Like, living water, what? The heck are you talking about, Jesus? And Jesus answered, everybody who drinks this water, and he points at the well. Oh, you'll drink that, you'll be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternity. And there's our word, eternity. So surprise, Jesus was actually never talking about water. He wasn't talking about real dehydration. He wasn't talking about how like Gatorade has more electrolytes than water, therefore is better at quenching thirst. Like he's talking, he's talking about her soul. He's talking about a spiritual thirst. He's talking, of course, about something that is much bigger. You see, this woman has been on a hunt her entire life, like all of us are, searching for fulfillment. Ecclesiastes, Solomon, Solomon would say that we have have a, a hole in our hearts that is the size of eternity. And we try to fill it because we, we long for this unconditional love. We long to be complete. And we try to complete ourselves and fill this eternally sized hole with a bunch of temporary stuff. For some of us, it's, it's money or success or what other people think about us. For this woman, it was relationships, specifically marriages. Because you know why she's at the well at noon all by herself in the heat of the desert is because she's had five marriages and five divorces. All of them have failed, and now she's living with a man who's not even her husband. Therefore, she's an outcast because as far as society is concerned, in the great experiment to find fulfillment and crush it, you have failed in every way possible. But man, this is... See, if we don't find ourselves in this woman's shoes, we're missing the whole point of this story. That we all have that same space in our hearts, the size of eternity. And we all look to temporary things under the sun to fill it. And you know what? For a while it does. A little bit of that there. A little, like, like for a while it actually works until push comes to shove. And then all of a sudden, you come face to face with the fact that nothing under the sun will work. You get to the end of yourself. I mean, we see parallels of this in the prodigal son story. The younger son who runs away and like he, he squanders all of his dad's wealth on, on lavish and sinful living. And it works until it doesn't. And he finds himself in the lowest of lows thinking, how did I get here? Push has come to shove right now. I'm at the end of myself. I mean, for a lot of us, even external circumstances like a, a, a virus pandemic or losing a job or watching your bank account just do this and all of a sudden you come face to face with, I think my hope was actually stored up here. I think I've actually been drinking from a, a temporary well that keeps leaving me thirsty. And what happens in that moment is actually something very, very beautiful because you come, you come face to face with your mortality. And in a lot of ways, you, you sober up to this idea of eternity that for a while you didn't have to think about because we're really good like this woman at distracting ourselves and numbing ourselves from having to answer those big questions. For instance, what do I think about God and what does he think about me? And do I know where I'm going when I die? Because this could all be over just like that. Life can, the rug can get pulled out from beneath you just like that at any moment. And so what if a virus pandemic, and here's the thing, I know with all of my heart that God does not cause evil. With all of my heart, God does not cause evil. But I also know even more than that, that he takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it around and uses it for good. Like we know that, that's a foundation that you can stand on and take to the bank. And so what if a virus pandemic, while you're nervous about your future and your present, and maybe even confronting your mortality for the first time in a long time. What if this is the most fertile ground that exists for sitting down next to your well and having a face-to-face -face conversation with the creator of the universe? See, in high school, <laughs> I played a guitar in our youth group band um, before I got kicked out of youth group, and that's another story for another day. Um, <laughs> but we played with uh, my buddy Tyson. Tyson was the, the drummer in our band. 
And uh, he was the man, an awesome drummer, one of my best friends, and, and like one of the best Christians I had ever met. Tyson also had Hunter syndrome, a genetic disorder that causes physical changes and organ dysfunctions. So Tyson's growth, his body, and his mind were all stunted. He was, he was dealt a bad hand, you could say. Um, so he couldn't play sports. He grew to about three foot six, and he couldn't drive. He couldn't go to a normal school. He couldn't live a normal life. All he could do was play drums, and so he did it with all of his heart. And for some reason, like, he was dealt a different hand than I was. And I've never met somebody with more of an eternal perspective. Like Tyson was sobered up to the idea of heaven. He was face to face with, face with his mortality every single day. Like he loved Jesus with all of his heart. And death wasn't something that he was, he was afraid of. I think Tyson knew, man, my home is not here. My real home is there. And one day I'll be there. At the end of high school, me and Tyson stayed friends but we went two different directions. He pursued Jesus and I pursued the world, like a lot of us do. I, I ran from church and I, I thought I've, you know, I've, I've got a lot of things going for me. I, I have a lot of friends. I just got my license for crying out loud. Like I'm gonna live forever. That was my, that's truly what I thought. And that's how I lived. And like the woman at the well, I tried every well. I tried every avenue possible and continued to come up short over and over and over. And it would work for a little bit until it did. And, and then all of a sudden, it was, it was my junior year of college, I think. Um, Tyson was home alone one afternoon and he was, he was sick. And he, uh, while he was sleeping and taking a nap, he suffocated and passed away. It was my first experience with death in my life when I was at an age where I could actually stop and think about eternity and how fragile and short life is because compared to Tyson, like I had everything going for me. Here's what I realized. My body was physically bigger than his, but his soul was astronomically bigger than mine. My immediate future had way more potential than his, but his eternal future had way more potential than mine. And I'm not sure exactly how it works in heaven and on new earth, but I promise you, Tyson is not three foot six anymore. Tyson is a spiritual giant and he will be for the next 10 billion years. And even at that point, he'll be just getting started. He is with God, he is home and trust me, he's doing good, he's doing good. Oh, he's doing good. And that's what I, I said when I spoke at his funeral and realized as I was saying it, I'm face to face with my mortality for the first time in my life. Two weeks later, I was snowboarding with my best friend, Colin, at Breckenridge in the Rockies. It was late one afternoon. The mountain um, was really empty. It was, it was like me and Colin and that was it. And uh, we were racing down a slope. Colin was right in front of me. And I remember um, we, were, we were flying and we went over this lip and right on the other side of the lip in a, a blind spot, there was a, a young girl who was stuck. She had just torn her ACL and couldn't move. And we didn't see her until a split second before it would have been too late. And Colin saw her and wiped out to the right. I saw her and wiped out to the left. Colin went head first into a tree. And it kind of hit me slowly because I, I stood up like that was a bad wipeout and I looked over into the trees and saw Colin and he wasn't moving and I ran over to him and he was still breathing but he wouldn't respond when I tried to wake him up and I didn't know what to do and I didn't have cell phone service. And I ran out into the middle of the, the slope just to try to flag somebody down. And wouldn't you know, about two minutes later, the only other guy that we saw for about an hour came down on his skis and he stopped and he just happened to be an ER doctor. When stuff like this happens, like I told you, Jesus does not do coincidence. And, and he kind of did his thing with Colin and, and uh, got him into a stable position. Colin was, was, was still out of it and uh, got the the ski patrol and they, they took him to the Breck hospital and long story short, an hour later, 
I am standing outside of the Breckenridge Hospital with the chaplain, who I am convinced is an angel that God sent to me, watching the helicopter with my best buddy fly away to, to Denver. And the chaplain asked me, well, first he said this. He said, hey, I know you don't want um, any fluff right now. And so when I tell you that this is serious, and it is, what the doctors mean by that is there's a, there's a chance your buddy's not gonna live through this helicopter ride to Denver. Like, this is bad. And he looked at me and he asked two questions and I'll never forget. He said, does Colin know Jesus? I didn't have an answer for him. Colin and I never talked about that. I said, I, I don't, honestly, I don't know. And then he turned it on me and said, how about you? Do you know Jesus? And I had to confront eternity right then and there. And I realized, yeah, I think I do. I, I know, like, I, I've always known God was real. Um, not through experience, but through, like, hearing about it. And I guess I just kind of always thought one day I'll come back to that and fess up to the fact that he is real. One day I will confront my mortality. One day I will sober up to this idea of eternity. But life or God, whatever you want to call it, decided that my moment for sobering up to eternity was going to be that moment right there. And I realized watching that helicopter fly away, my best friend is on the brink of eternity right now, but all of us, on honestly are at the brink of eternity every single day. David said, your life is like a mist. Here today, gone tomorrow. Your life can be like the dew on the grass, gone before lunchtime. Like virus pandemic or not, like we could get killed in a car wreck tomorrow. You are on the brink of eternity at every moment. And so sobering up to eternity might just be the greatest gift that you get. And I'm not saying God takes joy in the fact that horrible things happen and, and, and friends pass away. Or my, my, my friend Colin, who by the way is, is better now. Um, he was in a coma for two months. It was the longest two months of my entire life. And I'm not saying that God takes joy in that, but I am saying that God can use evil for good. And it's moments like that that are the most fertile ground for you coming face to face with the creator of the universe and finally having an honest conversation with him about where you plan on spending the rest of your eternity. What do you think about God? And what do you think God thinks about you? I am telling you, that is fertile ground for amazing conversations with Jesus. To quote John Foreman again, this body is not my own. This world is not my home. This skin and these bones are just rentals. Nobody makes it out of this thing alive. Nobody does. We're at a place right now where so many horrible things are just happening in our world. A virus pandemic, people are getting sick, people are passing away, people are living in fear, people are losing jobs, there's a financial crisis, like people, like people are lonely in isolation. We are hurting right now and in so many ways, much like this woman at the well, much like the prodigal son, you find, you find yourself at the end of yourself where you realize, I've been putting all of my hope in this world. I've been putting all of my hope in my job. I've been putting all of my hope in, in hookups or the next high. I've been putting all of my hope. As long as I have this, I'm okay. But what about when you no longer have that? As long as I have air in my lungs. Well, what if you don't have air in your lungs? We're not guaranteed 2021. Virus pandemic or not, that's always going to be true. And it's kind of like Jesus comes in and says, let's do a bank account transfer. I want you to take all of your hope that you've been storing here and we're gonna transfer it to eternity. We're gonna transfer it to heaven. And that's a place that no recession can touch and no tragedy can take over. I promise you, if you store your hope in heaven, nothing can touch it. And that's why Christians can, can be diamonds when push comes to shove and the pressure is on. And people wonder all the time, 
What is it about you Christians that enables you to, to get through seasons like this with a smile on your face? And we feel fear, absolutely, but somehow that fear doesn't have us. And we feel anxiety, but somehow we can still feel this peace and joy that transcends all understanding, so much so that we can share it with other people. And seasons like this actually fuel the church and make us better. And we come alive when the world becomes more and more desperate because we know the solution. It's because our hope is not here. It's because our hope is there. So where do you put your hope? You're sobered up to eternity. And sometimes when you're sobered to eternity, it changes your eternity. I wanna challenge you, use this season to have an honest conversation with God because he wants to talk to you. He, he'll go through Samaria where nobody else will go to rendezvous with you. God does not do coincidence. Come to him as you are, all of your flaws. Like he knew every, everything you do, like all the stuff you'd mess up with, everything that you do wrong. He knew your resume before he came to die for you. You're not, you're not the one person who's surprising him by your ability to mess up. Come as you are and have the conversation and find out and experience firsthand how crazy the creator of the entire universe is about you. I'm telling you, seasons like this, pandemics, I believe with all my heart, not from God, but he can use them for good. Right after 9-11, every church was jam-packed because people thought about forever and thought about God maybe for the, the first time in their entire lives. And so once again, if you've ever thought, listen to me, if you've ever thought, it's not a coincidence, I'm asking you this. If you've ever thought, I wonder if there's more, I'm telling you that there is. I'm telling you, on the other side of this tree, in the shadow that you're standing in, there is a sun that this shadow proves the existence of, shining brighter and bigger and better than you could ever imagine. And it's not a religion. It's not a list of rules. It's not even a concept. It's not some ethereal deity out there. It's a personal God who calls you by name and wants a relationship with you. This is what separates Christianity from every other major world religion, is we're not trying to give Get, get like around something to finally get to God. Like if I can clean up my life and I can climb over and conquer this mountain of sin, then God will finally love and accept me. No, Christianity is the one religion that says God left paradise in the form of Jesus to come and get you when you were useless to him. And he knew what he paid an infinite price for. He loves you that much. Your hope can be in eternity today if you simply just receive Jesus into your life. And it doesn't change circumstances, but it does change your spirit. And you can live lighter. And even though you feel fear, you don't have to have it. It doesn't have to have you. Like I even think of Lazarus, he died. And then four days later, Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. And I picture Lazarus walking out of his tomb, like kind of mad. <laughs> like, Jesus, I was just in paradise, bro. You brought me back here? <laughs> but think about it this way. You think Lazarus was afraid of anything for the rest of his life? You think Lazarus was afraid of persecution or financial problems? You think Lazarus would be afraid of a, a virus pandemic? What else, like, what do you have left to scare Lazarus with? He was like, oh, I was, I died already. And you know what? It's pretty amazing. <laughs> you got nothing, nothing evil to threaten me with because my hope is not here. My hope is in heaven stored up there. This was the Apostle Paul. That's why the Apostle Paul was so untouchable. That's why he could say a crazy thing like to live is Christ and to die is gain. So they would say, Paul, we're gonna kill you. And he'd go, oh, to die is gain, bro, awesome. All right, well, we'll let you live. Oh, to live is Christ, man, awesome. Oh, uh, all right, well, we're gonna, we're gonna torture you. Oh, well, I don't count the present sufferings as worthy to be compared to the future glory I got waiting for me. Oh, okay, well, we're gonna throw you in prison, Paul. 
It's the dungeons for you. Oh, well, I'm going to sing hymns and worship songs while I'm down there and probably convert every single one of your guards because my hope is not here. My hope is in there. And I don't live my life like the goal of my entire life is to arrive safely at death one day. This is a rental. Nobody makes it out of this alive. But this will be the worst place I ever exist. Like Tyson, like Paul, like Lazarus. I know what is waiting for me. And that gives me hope in the here and now there is peace for you to have and know. There is joy for you to experience. You have hope and this valley will end. In the meantime, you might be more sobered up to eternity than you've ever been in your entire life. I'm challenging you just to see that one part as a gift. Sobriety can be a gift. David did that as an exercise. He came face to face with his mortality all the time and meditated on how fragile his life was because he wasn't living for this life. He was living for that life. This isn't about making the things and our circumstances smaller. This is about making our God bigger because he is. He is bigger than a virus pandemic. This too, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. In the meantime, in the shadow of a pandemic, the shadow proves the sunshine. And as you're sobered up to your own eternity, sit down next to your well and have a conversation with the creator of the universe. He'd rather do that than make the entire universe. RSVP yes to this invitation in this season. You can do that wherever you are. From your kitchen, from your living room, from your couch, in your car, at a church, wherever you are. No religion, just you and him. Just talk like a loving father who's looking down on you with approval and acceptance and a smile on his face. Taste and see that he is good. Experience what God thinks about you. And so Jesus... I know that you take evil and you turn it around and use it for good. And I pray that this season that our kids will one day read about in history books, I pray, I pray this season would be marked by you taking evil and doing something amazing with it and changing eternities with it, God. Would you turn Christians into diamonds? Would, you, would this fuel the church like any persecution or valley or trial has in all of history? Would we be better because of this? Would we be better so we can be strong for our neighbors, for our brothers and our sisters. We stand on the brink of eternity and we thank you that where we live right now will be the worst place we ever exist and it's pretty amazing in the meantime. Oh God, you're so good. Prove that to your kids in new ways in this season. In Jesus' name, amen.